our session was about quality in genetic testing. All of this uh, personalized medicine is driven by genotyping of, of either genotyping the parent patient or genotyping the tumor, uh, but there's very little focus on whether those genotypes are correct or not. So I was talking about the work of the EMQN, the European Molecular Genetics Quality Network, which is a worldwide network testing the quality of DNA testing uh, in, in laboratories. So they sign up for our external quality assessment schemes and we send them samples and, and they send us back the results and we tell them if they're right or they're wrong. But we also look at the interpretation of the result. So we send a mock clinical case with each sample and they have to write their full report on, on that. And it's quite worrying what we see with the adoption of new technologies. There's always a spike in errors and the spike in errors uh, for personalized medicine type testing, tumor testing, shows us that up to 35% of labs are getting the results wrong. If you send them 10 samples, up to 35% of labs will get one of those 10 samples wrong. It's not the kind of result we'd like to, to, to be finding, but it shows that we have a job to do to improve, and we see improvement from, uh, from year to year. I don't think you or I would like to be in hospital having cancer treatment based on a test that had a 35% chance of being wrong. So we, we, we need to expand our work and, uh, and push it forward. We're also uh, looking at regulation of genetic tests because the European regulations have just, uh, have just changed. There's going to be new obligations on, uh, on labs, whether they're testing for companion diagnostics or uh, routine diagnostics. Uh, they're going to have to uh, raise their standards, and the manufacturers will have to raise their standards also. And there's concerns about capacity there that the regulatory bodies, who are themselves under increased scrutiny with the new regulations, and many of them will actually fall out of the system and they won't get redesignated. Um, there, there won't be enough expertise there or manpower to recertify all the existing diagnostic devices, uh, test kits that labs are using and that some of the ones for that are marginally economically useful they may not be recertified and, and we'll have a so-called mass extinction of, uh, of marginal tests which will push a lot back on the labs then to do those tests in-house but there are increased requirements for labs that are using in-house tests as well uh, so everywhere you turn there's more re regulation coming some of it to raise standards and, and to, to keep patients safe, um, but it all comes with the resource requirement as well, and it's not clear where that's coming from. The quality issues, that the, the kinds of errors we see in, in, that gives us the error rates that I've been talking about, most of them are simple human errors, uh, but you've got to build your systems to be resilient to those kind of human errors with extra checking in there and, and uh, and uh, uh, sample identification uh, being more robust and having a quality system in place really is the, the summary of it. Accreditation for labs is, is not mandatory in Europe. Uh, it's, it's mandatory for blood testing labs, it's mandatory for veterinary testing labs and for food testing labs, but not for medical labs. It seems kind of crazy, uh, but this is uh, delegated to the individual countries in, in, uh, under the European treaties. and. Uh, it leads to a patchwork of quality across, uh, across Europe. If we had mandatory accreditation, everybody would have to rise to the same standard. But of course, there would be resource issues in, in that as well, so that's why it's been resisted.